All right, good afternoon. We should probably get started. Um, happy Monday. I see winter is finally here, so everybody happy about that? Snow. You know the structure of ice, right? Well, at least you know the structure of water. Um, okay, I want to uh, finish up chapter one today, which is uh, uh, mostly the review of general chemistry, and then move into chapter two. Um, and chapter two really starts to get into a little more details about properties and structures of organic molecules. So hopefully it'll be a little more exciting for you. Um, just to remind you, we were talking about structures and shapes of molecules last time, and we, we saw that uh, molecules adopt shapes which are the lowest energy configurations based on uh, this idea that we have the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. That is, electrons try to get as far apart as possible, right, when they're um, in adjacent bonds or lone pairs. So that gives structures to molecules where carbon has a, a symmetric tetrahedral structure with four equal bonds. And water also adopts a tetrahedral structure when you consider the lone pairs that are there. So we have two bonds to hydrogen with its electrons in it, we have two lone pairs, and each of those would adopt four uh, similar types of orientations, also a tetrahedral structure. Um, and if you don't have electrons, for example, boring is flat because one of its orbitals is empty, uh, and so it adopts a planar structure. Um, and when we start to have different kinds of bonding, double bonds and triple bonds, uh, that affects the structure and the geometry of the molecule as well, uh, based on the way it bonds. And in the next, in this chapter two, we're going to talk a lot about the types of bonding in organic molecules, uh, and we'll, we'll go into more detail about these kinds of pi bonds. Okay, we also talked about um, how we how we write chemistry in terms of arrow notation. There are several different kinds of arrows that we talked about: reaction arrows. Equilibrium arrows, resonance arrows, and uh, we talked about how to describe electron flow using curved arrows. Okay, so whenever we see curvy arrows, that's uh, indicating where electrons are moving. Um, and we started to talk about acid and base concepts. So just to recall, an acid under the Brunston Lowry <coughs> definition is a substance which donates a proton, and a base under the Brunston Lowry definition is a substance which accepts a proton. So in this uh, simple uh, equation here, this equilibrium of an acid and water, acid is the base, it's giving up the proton, water, I'm sorry, acid is the acid, Brunson lowry acid gives up the proton, the lone pair on the water oxygen is the base, okay, and that accepts the proton. And the strengths of acids and bases are described by this equilibrium, right? Uh, and we're going to go a little more in detail about how the structures of the acid and the conjugate base that's formed once it gives up the proton uh, gives us some idea about relative strengths. Again, I don't need you to, rec to uh, memorize all the different pKa values for different molecules. What I want you to get some idea about is what kinds of things contribute to the relative differences. So could you see what might be more or less acidic based on what you see in the structure, not necessarily memorizing the pKa values. Okay? So we talked about the, these issues being uh, contributors to the overall uh, acidity of, of molecules. So the strength of the bond to the hydrogen that's coming off as a proton, uh, that has a lot to do with how acidic it is. Electronegativity effects, um, have something to do with that, as well as the stability of the anion that's generated once the proton is given off. Okay, that affects both the bond strength as well as the uh, ease of proton uh, removal. So if you, if you think about this example here, this is the uh, mineral acids, HF all the way through to HI. So we're going down the periodic table from HF to HCl to HBr to HI, and as you go down the periodic table, the acid strength gets higher. Okay, so we go from a pKa of HF about 3 to a pKa for HI about uh, minus 10, so significantly more acidic. All right, uh, but we're getting less electronegative, and usually electronegativity has the opposite effect of that. 
the role here is um, not necessarily the electronegativity, which is the dominant factor. It's the bond strength, which is reflected also by the bond length. Okay, as you go down the periodic table, the hydrogen halogen bond length becomes longer, and that makes it weaker. So the longer the bond, generally the weaker it's going to be. Uh, and so this is a, a good example of how bond strength is affecting the acidity. Okay, if you go across the periodic table, you do see effects in the bond dissociation of the proton based on the electronegativity. Okay, so here we're looking at uh, a bond to hydrogen from a carbon, and then you move to the right on the periodic table, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Here you're not necessarily changing the size of the atom significantly, so you're not affecting too much the bond distance or the bond strength in that regard, but we're affecting the electronegativity of the atom that the hydrogen is attached to. And you can see you go from uh, what would never give up a proton, a pKa of 60 for methane, all the way to a pKa of 3 for HF. Okay? So, something to keep in mind when we describe the properties of molecules and the structural features which give rise to those properties, uh, oftentimes there are multiple factors involved. And in some cases, one factor might dominate, or in another case, a different factor dominates. Here, it's clearly electronegativity, not bond strength. We're in the previous case, just looking at the halogen series, it was bond uh, strength, not electronegativity. Okay, those electronegative atoms also help to uh, acidify things from further away. So if you get one or two bonds away, you still have some effects of that electron withdrawing nature of the substituent. So if you take a look at this series of acetic acids, where we have replaced one atom on the carbon, uh, and compare that down the row, if you go from a hydrogen to an iodine, for example, uh, you jump from a pKa of 4.7 to about 3, so about 1.6 difference in pKa. And as you get more and more electronegative, okay, you get uh, a greater and greater ability for that proton to come off as an as a acid to protonate something. Okay? Why is there an effect like that? Well, keep in mind, whenever we have an electronegative atom, that polarizes the bond that's attached to it, right? So we have a bond dipole for that uh, carbon X bond. And by doing that, you're shifting the electron density closer to the halogen, right? So when you do that, you're making this carbon a little more positive. That has an, uh, an effect which we refer to as the inductive effect. Inductive effect. It's polarizing bonds through, uh, polarizing electron density through the signal bonds. So if this becomes a little bit more positive, then this starts to pull and all the way to affect then the acidity of the proton. Okay, that effect drops off the further and further away it goes. Okay, so if you were to have another CH2 in between here, another carbon in between there, the effect of that electronegativity would drop off dramatically. There wouldn't be as great a difference, even though you can see this is not that huge of a difference, but you, it would be smaller <laughs> if there were more carbons in between. <coughs> And of course, if you think about it, it uh, should be pretty straightforward that if you add more electronegative atoms, that effect is additive. So here we have all these fluorines withdrawing electron density from that sigma bond closer to it. So that could be the bond is polarized, and that has the effect of polarizing this. Obviously, this is going to be uh, more greatly affected by those electronegative atoms than this one, because there's only one case on the left. Make sense? Okay. Uh, well, the, the type of functional group or the type of atom that the proton is attached to has a lot to do with its acidity. As you can see here, if you look at various alcohols and compare that with water, the acidities are very, very similar. 
Uh, the effect is not that different when you go from water to methanol to ethanol to isopropanol or tertiary butanol. You get a little bit of difference. Those carbons do affect things. So we're, we're comparing a carbon group to a hydrogen. So you, do, you would expect some small effects. And that's what we see, some, some subtle changes <coughs> in the pKa. But they're still all around between 16 and 18. Okay. So the, one thing to think about is comparing the functional group. Okay. The OH functional group. They're all very, very similar. Uh, but sometimes other things can overwhelmingly <coughs> affect that pKa as well. If you take a look at this molecule, phenol. Okay, we also have an OH group, which is very, very similar to the other alcohols. It's just that the carbon group attached to it is different. But there's a huge difference in the pKa. We go from a pKa of about 16 up here to 10. That's six orders of magnitude difference in pKa. Right? So again, that's pKa. How many times more acidic is phenol than uh, ethanol? Can you do that conversion? It's 10 to the sixth difference, right? We're talking about a log, right? pKa. 10 to the sixth difference. It's a million times more acidic phenol <coughs> is than ethanol. Why is there such a huge difference in acidity for phenol? Any idea? Resonance, that's right. Uh, the acidity is directly related to how stable the anion is. Remember, the acidity is based on that equilibrium reaction from <coughs> the acid to the side of the equation where it's given up the proton. So if you make the right side of the equation lower in energy or more stable, Right? It's going to more easily go there. The equilibrium will shift towards that right side. That means the acid is going to be stronger. Uh, and that's the case here. If you take a look at phenol and you deprotonate that and take a look at the conjugate base that's generated from phenol once it's given up the proton, uh, that negative charge is actually delocalized, spread out through resonance structures. You can see where that negative charge is all spread out. Uh, greatly stabilizing that anion. So if the anion becomes much more stable, the left side of the equation is not going to be, uh, there's not going to be much concentration of this anymore because that proton can come up so easily. So what are those resonance forms? Can you draw the resonance forms for phenol? Practice drawing your resonance structures. Okay, you have a negative charge on oxygen. I'll just draw in the lone pairs here. Uh, to show you there are three lone pairs on oxygen that wasn't written before. Where do those electrons go if we want to represent the different resonance forms? <laughs> well, we could push those electrons down to form a double bond to the oxygen. At the same time, though, you have to break this bond. So the electrons that are in that double bond have to shift up. Okay, that describes how electrons might uh, flow in this. Notice I'm using a resonance arrow in my crude drawing here. Okay, those electrons ended up on that carbon, so the negative charge now is on that carbon. And in this particular structure, we can keep doing that. We could push these down here and put those up here. Okay. Now the negative charge is down on that bond carbon. And we can continue. There's another double bond next to that. And so we can draw all the four possible resonance structures for the phenoxide ion. Okay. See how that charge is actually uh, delocalized or spread out among four different positions, right? If we have negative charge on the oxygen, and then we have negative charge on three different carbons. Actually, uh, if you look at those resonance forms and take the sum of them, uh, this one probably contributes more than the other three to some extent, because the oxygen is a more electronegative atom. Uh, 
But all of those residence forms contribute to the overall structure of what actually exists. Remember, residence forms that we draw are just our Lewis representations of the extremes of where charges are, but the charge really is delocalized. Okay? Uh, a key point to always remember, the more you can delocalize charge or spread it out, the more stable it is. Okay, that's a very key point. Always remember that. The more you can spread out charge, the more stable it is. That's true for negative charges. That's true for positive charges. So the more resonance forms you can draw <coughs> to go further and further away, uh, the lower energy it will be. And that's why phenol is much more acidic than your typical water or alcohol. It's because uh, the anion you can generate is so stable uh, relative to the other species that the resonance affects um, dominant energy. Okay, compare these two molecules. Uh, these pKa's are um, vastly different for the exact same reason. We can draw resonance forms to spread out the negative charge for one of the conjugate bases and not the other. Okay? So if you take a look at ethanol here, and you react this with, with the uh, base, like hydroxide, <coughs> okay, take that proton off, what do you form? <clears throat> we form an alkoxide ion, but that negative charge is localized on the oxygen. There are no double bonds next to it. Uh, nowhere for that negative charge to be spread out, right? <laughs> Ethanol is a pKa of 16. If you look at acetic acid, the pKa is about 5. If you do the same thing here, take that proton off with a base like hydroxide, Then you generate an acetate ion. And you can see now that we have a, a lone pair of electrons on this oxygen. That actually has a negative charge. We could easily push that down and kick this bond up, right? So we could draw another resonance form for this, where that, where that negative charge is spread out between both of those oxygens. It's the worst oxygen I've ever drawn. Okay, so when you have resonance forms, uh, that greatly stabilizes it. And I want to keep reiterating that because it's a concept which will come up over and over again in a lot of different contexts. The more you spread out charge, the more stable it will be. Okay? Any questions on the structural features that lead to acidity? We have three basic things. The bond strength. Obviously, the weaker it is, the easier it will give up the proton, the higher the acid strength. Uh, electronegativity and resonance both lead to stability of the anion or shifting that equilibrium more to the right when possible. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about that equilibrium. That equilibrium can tell us a lot. Uh, if we do know qualitatively or quantitatively what relative acid strengths are, and actually, qualitative understanding of that is very useful as well. You don't necessarily need to know the specific pKa's. If you can determine, just looking at the structure, based on those things we've just talked about, what might be a much stronger acid than another, you can get some idea about <coughs> equilibrium of reaction. The difference in acid strength, so the pKa's, can tell us a lot about how the reaction proceeds. Okay. So in an equilibrium, and actually in any chemical equilibrium, that equilibrium will lie on the side of the more stable species, right? So the more reactive the species, the less they're going to be around. They're going to have less concentration of those. It's going to lie on the more stable side. So if a reaction as written from left to right will be favorable if the stronger acid is on the left side and the weaker acid is on the right side. So remember we have an acid on the left side of the equation and whatever accepted that proton becomes the conjugate acid on the right side of the equation. And you can directly look at the, or compare their acid strengths to get an idea about which way the equilibrium will lie. 
So if you take a look at this example, okay, we have the same two species we were talking about, acetic acid and ethanol. Ethanol reacting with acetate, okay, would form the ethoxide ion plus acetic acid. That's how the uh, protonation or deprotonation is working. So which way does this equilibrium lie? Yeah, it lies to the right side. Does it lie to the right <laughs> side? Which side has the stronger acid? <coughs> I'm giving you the pK numbers. You don't have to know based on the structure. Yeah, the right side of the equation has the stronger acid. This is the stronger acid. Okay. Notice pK of 4.7 versus a pK of 16. So obviously this equilibrium is not going to be a 50-50 mixture of the right side and the left side. This is going to be overwhelmingly shifted to the left side of the equation. Right? Based on that acid strength difference. By a million times. Well, more than that. 10 to the 10 to the 6, 7, right? By 10 to the 7th times, going to lie to the left. So that means there's hardly any of the reaction going to be lying on the right side. Okay, so this species will be on the more stable left side. I easily could have written this reaction the other way around, and then of course it would be uh, shifted to the right. Now, if I hadn't given you the pKa values, would you be able to predict the, which side of the, that reaction will lie on? <coughs> Yeah, you have to understand the relative stabilities based on the structural features, not necessarily based on memorizing those numbers, based on the structural features, right? We have acid, and we have an anion, and we have an acid, and we have an anion. You can look at the anions on each side and see which of those would be more stable. That's just the direct opposite of the acidity. So the more stable anion, less stable anion. Okay. The more stable anion was produced from the more acidic acid, okay, and the less stable anion was produced from the less acidic acid. See how those are related? And we're really talking about how stable the anion is or the base acidity of those is also directly comparable to the acidity of their conjugate acids. All right, make sense? Okay. Well, there's another concept of acid base, which is actually a broader definition of acids and bases than just looking at protons. So if you recall, Bronsted acid is a proton donor, and a Bronsted base is a proton acceptor. And that's actually a subset of what we refer to as Lewis acids and bases. The definition is slightly different uh, and broader. A Lewis acid is defined as a substance that accepts a pair of electrons. A substance which accepts a pair of electrons. It forms a covalent bond. And a Lewis base is a substance which donates a pair of electrons to form a bond. Okay, so if you think about uh, that definition, right, an acid-base reaction fits right in line with that. So if you think about uh, HCl plus OH minus, Right? Sorry, my drawing's terrible. Um, can you read that? Okay, HCl, obviously we had something which accepted a pair of electrons. This proton accepted the electrons being donated by the oxygen, OH minus. So this is a Lewis acid in, this, in the sense of this definition. And this is the Lewis base. Okay. The difference is that there are more examples of this concept that go beyond just protons for, for acids. And that's why the Lewis acid definition is a broader definition. Bronsted acids, by definition, are a subset. But what about something like this? Okay. Remember we had this molecule. <laughs> well, I'll just use this one. 
something like VF3, boron trifluoride. Boron trifluoride has an empty orbital. It doesn't have an octet, okay? Because it only starts with three valence electrons. So it's actually not happy. Well, it's pretty stable, but it could it, it could um, benefit from having eight electrons around it. So it could accept a pair of electrons from something. Say, for example, ammonia. Ammonia has a lone pair of electrons. Boron has an empty orbital. Okay, you could imagine nitrogen donating or forming a bond, sharing those electrons with the boron. That would form a new com complex. Okay, where we form a bond now between the nitrogen and the boron. Okay, so the nitrogen has donated the electrons. Now, there's something wrong with this structure because if you look at all the formal charges here, these atoms can't be zero. Uh, and if you calculate the formal charges like we did last week, you would see the nitrogen with four bonds has to have a formal plus charge. And the boron with four bonds has a formal minus charge. Okay? It's possible to have two neutral species which act as a Lewis acid, Lewis base, and form a complex where now you have formal charges involved. Uh, the boron, or the species which has electron deficiency, if looking for electrons, this is the Lewis acid. It accepted the electrons. Obviously, it has to lack electrons if, it, if it's accepting them, right? And this is the Lewis base. It's donating the electrons. See how this, something like this is an acid-base type process, but it's not described by Arrhenius or bronsted lowry definitions, because those are only dealing with protons. This type of uh, interaction is very common <coughs> among many of the metals. If you have metal cations, uh, lithium plus or sodium plus or magnesium plus, and then you have donation to that from uh, some atom which has a lone pair, oxygen with a lone pair, nitrogen with a lone pair, uh, some, a carbon with a negative charge lone pair. Those are Lewis acid, Lewis base uh, reactions. Okay. So that's an expanded definition, and it's an important one to recognize as we talk about reactivity of molecules. We, we see a lot, number of examples of this. Um, for example, a substitution reaction, if you think about this reaction, well, let's just take this. Uh, let me get my drawing here. Okay, we had hydroxide reacting with something like HBr. Okay. This is an acid-base reaction where, or a Lewis acid-base or a bronsted lowry acid-base reaction. Where we've done this, this uh, process. We've transferred the proton, but notice what happened here. The negative charge of the oxygen attacks the hydrogen. The hydrogen is accepting those electrons. At the same time, in this case, the bromine is taking the electrons away. So you break the HDR bond. Okay? This is directly comparable to a reaction of organic molecules that we're going to be studying a little later uh, called nucleophilic substitution reactions. So if you think about this reacting instead of with HBr, a carbon with a bromine bond. Okay? A carbon with a bromine bond is polarized. The carbon has partial positive charge, the bromine has a partial negative charge. And you can do the same kind of thing. Oxygen can attack the carbon atom, kicking off the bromine. And now we have a product that didn't involve a transfer of a proton, right? But you can see the analogy, analogies between 
um, an acid-base reaction under the bronson lowry sense and the substitution reaction, which is an organic chemical reaction, right? The concepts are the same. You have electron density, and you're going to a place where there is lacking electron density. So there's electron density here on this OH, and we have on this carbon a partial plus charge because of this polarized bond. That's the, a general concept in chemistry that we have to always keep in mind. Areas of high electron density will seek areas of low electron density. Okay? And that dictates a lot of different kinds of reactions. Now, we have some definitions um, when we talk about this beyond acid-base chemistry and talk about it under reaction. So um, the Lewis base, or something that has electron density, we refer to, in this case, as a nucleophile. Okay, does that word make sense? Nucleophile? Nucleus? Lover. Okay, nucleophile. What does that tell you about the properties of that species? It's looking, for, yeah, it must have a lot of electron density because it's looking for a nucleus. Looking for a positive charge. And we refer to that as a nucleophile, that hydroxide ion. The HBr in this particular reaction, or this bromomethane, we refer to as, anybody have a guess? An electrophile. An electrophile. <coughs> it's looking for electrons. So they're just looking to meet up. Electrophiles and nucleophiles, these are terms we'll be using over and over again to describe different partners in chemical reactions. Okay? So, we have uh, acids, bases, various definitions. The broadest definition is Lewis acid, Lewis bases. The concepts for that and other kinds of reactions are very similar. Things with electron density seek areas where there is less electron density, and that's where we form bonds or uh, break bonds. Okay. As we go on talking about specific reactions in this class, those concepts you need to keep in mind because they're very, very important and can help you out a lot. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about details of organic molecules now, and this is what chapter two describes alkanes or hydrocarbons. Okay, so we have this word hydrocarbon, indicating hydrogens and carbons. And that's uh, the, the simplest um, definition of organic molecules are those containing carbon and hydrogen. Their sources are mostly from petroleum. Not always, but uh, simple hydrocarbons mostly come from petroleum. So fossil uh, fuels lead to a lot of them. Uh, we, di we divide hydrocarbons into various classes, and what we see are that um, we have two kinds, aliphatic and aromatic. These are sort of special classes of organic molecules, hydrocarbons. The aliphatics are those carbon and hydrogen containing molecules uh, which are, don't have some special energetic properties. There's a certain class which we call aromatic hydrocarbons or aranes. The simplest of the aranes is benzene. And when we get to talking about benzene later in the semester, you'll understand why that's been separated out. There's some, some uh, additional stability to this molecule which can't be explained just by the bond enthalpies for that molecule. Okay, and it has to do with the fact that it's a ring and has those alternating double bonds. But for most aliphatic hydrocarbons, um, we have alkanes, which are all carbon-carbon single bonds, alkenes, which possess carbon-carbon double bonds, and alkynes, which have a carbon-carbon triple bond. All right. Uh, one thing to notice also, this relates to some of the uh, issues of naming organic molecules. Notice the ending of these, A-N-E, E-N-E, and Y-N-E. That is uh, the ending 
of the naming system we have for molecules when we start to talk about specific molecules. This is the general name, <coughs> alkane. When you talk about specific molecules like propane, that's a three carbon chain that has all single bonds. A propene would have a double bond, and a propine would have a triple bond. Okay, in order to really understand uh, some of the bonding and shapes of molecules, we need to have some idea about uh, bonding theory. Um, I just want to reassure you that I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate molecular orbital theory. Uh, it is rather <coughs> abstract, uh, but it's important to have some idea about what the theory is trying to say. When we talk about bonding in organic molecules, uh, we can look at two different uh, concepts. The valence bond theory, in which we're looking at the atoms and the atomic orbitals and just overlapping them and sharing electrons and coding the bonds. Or we can talk about molecular orbital theory. The difference is that uh, we have gotten rid of the atomic orbitals from each of the atoms, and, we, and mathematically we calculate orbitals that cover the whole molecule. Uh, sometimes it's hard to visualize that, uh, and it is a little more abstract. It becomes important much later when we talk about some of the alkene chemistry, but uh, for understanding structure, it's not necessarily that important uh, for understanding ML theory. But let's look at the simplest molecule, hydrogen, H2. Uh, and if you think about what is a bond in, in hydrogen, right, it is that distance where uh, the atoms have the lowest energy when they're associated with each other. All right. So if you just think about two hydrogen atoms separated by space, okay, those have a certain amount of energy. As you bring them closer and closer together, okay, you get interactions between those electrons. And why would that energy go down? Anybody know why that energy would go down? No, not because we're putting energy into it. Because if we have species which have unpaired electrons, right, and now we're sharing those electrons, we're filling that valence shell. Okay. So as you bring those closer together, those electrons now can be shared in a covalent bond, and the energy goes down. But only to a certain point, depending on the size of the atom, the size of the nucleus, once you get to a certain distance, a minimum distance, the more you try to cram those atoms together, uh, the higher the energy goes because you have now repulsive forces between the nuclei. Uh, and that's why you see as you continue to decrease the distance between the two hydrogen atoms, the energy goes up very rapidly. Okay? Up to infinity, because infinity, you can't overlap the two nuclei. So this uh, sort of low point on this energy curve, that's the average bond length. And that will depend on, the, again, the size of the atoms that you're connecting together. Uh, and that difference in energy will change depending on the types of atoms that are involved. Uh, this is referring to the bond enthalpy. So the energy it would take to take a hydrogen molecule and separate those atoms into their radical species. That's the bond enthalpy. Same thing with a carbon-hydrogen bond or a carbon-carbon bond. They would have a slightly different energy and a different distance. Uh, but the same, similar kind of concept that we think about the energy related to the distance of those. So clearly the sharing of those electrons and the filling of the valence shell stabilizes that. That's why molecules exist. Okay, as opposed to just having free atoms floating along. Uh, in valence bond theory, um, that takes into account the fact that electrons have wave properties. So when bonding theory uh, was first uh, being thought about, we didn't know about wave properties of electrons. You can calculate those mathematically um, based on the wave functions for each of the individual S orbitals on the hydrogens. Um, and if you do that, what you find out is that there's a situation where uh, those wave properties of the electrons reinforce as those nuclei come together. That forms a bond. And in valence bond theory, there's a case where those 
cancel each other as waves would do, right? Depending on how whether they're in phase or out of phase with each other. So in this case, you would not have uh, a bond. Uh, and again, most of this is just based on the mathematics of those wave functions. In valence bond theory, uh, they consider those wave functions just to be, you consider the orbitals that you're talking about and then just overlapping them so you can share the electrons in a bond. That's valence bond theory. This is the theory that we generally uh, use to describe as I draw structures. We'll be talking mostly in valence bond theory. Uh, atomic orbitals on the atoms and how they overlap. Uh, MO theory, as I said, is much more abstract. It calculates brand new orbitals with completely different shapes that go beyond just two atoms in a molecule that show how electron density might be spread out. Uh, and it probably it's a more true representation of the electron density in a molecule. However, it's very, very hard to visualize. So we don't bother. I'll show you though, in the hydrogen, the um, valence bond model and the molecular orbital theory model actually look very, very similar. It's when you start to get larger molecules where you get differences. Uh, so in valence bond theory, uh, it's an overlap of s orbitals. So as you take these two hydrogen s orbitals and bring them together, the in phase uh, additive properties of the wave functions for those will just overlap and you'll get a hydrogen atom. So the electron pair then can, then can be shared between the two orbitals. Uh, between the two uh, nuclei. Now, when that happens, the electron density, this is a bit, little bit better picture of it. As those nuclei come together and form that bond, uh, what you see is that the electron density is greatest in this red region um, in between the two nuclei. Okay? That's a pretty simple model, uh, considering that we get pictures based on the quantum mechanical dis uh, calculations of the shape of the atomic orbital and how it might interact with, the, with another atomic orbital, we get um, a pretty simple picture of what the um, bonding might look like. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that a, a bond, which is an overlap of orbitals, which is an end-to-end -end overlap, and in which case, if it's just a sphere, like an S orbital, it can only overlap in one way, is what we refer to as a sigma bond. A sigma bond. So you'll see, you'll see me refer to sigma bonds a lot. That's the one end-to-end -end overlap of an orbital between two atoms. Okay, what about the molecular orbital theory? How does it differ from this valence bond theory that we're talking about for hydrogen? Well, the, the end picture is pretty much the same. However, the way it's described is a little different. Uh, in ML theory, the main ideas are that electrons in a molecule occupy molecular orbitals, no longer atomic orbitals. Once a molecule is generated, you no longer have atomic orbitals, you have all new orbitals. Those orbitals, as I said, could spread out over many atoms, uh, depending on the molecule. But just like atomic orbitals, a molecular orbital can only take two electrons in it. So if you have two nuclei come together, uh, the number of atomic orbitals you start with has to equal the number of molecular orbitals uh, that are produced. Otherwise, there wouldn't be room for all the electrons. Okay, but what happens also is it takes into account this, this idea that the wave properties of electrons provides a reinforcing or a subtractive effect. Okay, so if you Take the wave functions, remember this psi. Uh, we can describe the orbital of the molecule uh, based on the individual atomic orbitals where they add together. It's a bonding orbital and it becomes lower in energy. And where they are out of phase, then they are higher in energy. And the way that's sort of uh, presented uh, in, in an energy diagram is like this. So, here we have a hydrogen with a 1s orbital and another hydrogen with a 1s orbital. And as they come together, we form no longer s orbitals, we form two molecular orbitals, which is a combination of those atomic orbitals, but recalculated under the quantum mechanical picture. 
Uh, and one of them is lower in energy, and one of them is higher in energy. And the electrons will go into the lower energy orbital, obviously. Uh, that bonding orbital looks very much like that picture of overlap for hydrogen that we saw with the valence bond theory. And the anti-bonding orbital, the higher energy one, actually looks a little different. It has a separation in between. It shows you clearly that there's no real bond. The electrons aren't being shared between the hydrogens. Okay. Uh, again, I don't want you to worry too much about this. I wanted to present it now because some of these concepts might come up later in the course. Uh, when we think about bonding, I want you to picture the orbitals on the atoms and how they might be coming together because that's usually the most descriptive for describing uh, the structures. Okay, So let's take a look at some alkanes. Alkanes, or hydrocarbons, if they are um, alkanes and fully saturated, that is, carbons have four bonds and only single bonds, and the rest are hydrogens um, besides bonds to carbon, they will have a general formula of CnH2n plus 2. This is the general formula for an alkane. That is, no matter how many carbons you have in your molecule, for n number of carbons, you're going to have 2n plus 2 numbers of hydrogens on there. And you can see if you look at the first 10 possible alkanes, uh, that formula holds true. So methane has a, has a molecular formula of CH4, right? N is 1 here, so it's CH1 times 2 plus 2, 4. Uh, ethane, C2H6, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2 is 6. That's how many hydrogens would be fully saturated. So that's a general formula for an alkane. Uh, and when we connect the carbons together, you can see ethane would be CH3, CH3. That means there's a bond between the carbons, right? Propane has three carbons. Okay, we would draw in a line structure formula, something like that. CH3 on the end. CH2 in the middle, and a CH3 on the end. Butane, one, two, three, four, and so on. If you go down the row, adding another carbon to this, you add uh, uh, additional hydrogens, um, and the first 10, all the way up to decane. Decane, the straight chain of decane would look like that. Notice again the naming of these compounds. Alkanes, if there are no double or triple bonds, these all have single bonds, have an A-N-E ending. Okay. okay, well, I'm going to introduce this just before we end for today. I'm going to come back to this on Wednesday. But remember I told you that the structure of methane was a symmetric tetrahedral. And we explained that using the VSEPR model, right, the valence shell electron pair repulsion, because those electrons want to get as far apart as possible. But, and I'll leave you with this, what, if you think about what the electron configuration of carbon is, what is a carbon have? It has four valence electrons. We're not put that yet. Four valence electrons, right? What orbitals are they in in the ele elemental carbon? Right, we have a two, in the valence shell, we have a 2s orbital, and we have three 2p orbitals, right? And we have four valence electrons to fill. According to Hund's rules, we start <coughs> filling the lowest energy one first, right? And then we fill this one, one at a time until we fill them all. So, if that's the electron configuration for carbon, how can we have four bonds to carbon when one of these orbitals is already filled? Okay. We're going to come back to that on Wednesday. I uh, want you to think about that over the next couple of days. Also, please uh, remember that the first homework assignment, the uh, Learn Smart assignment is 
going to be completed on Wednesday evening, so make sure you, if you haven't logged in yet, register the next time.